Yeah, cheers, guys. Uh, I'm just going to do a little presentation, as it says there. So, nutritional update, updates for SOC. So, just some basic review from the literature. And I'll finish up with some suggestions for practice, really, just a few slides there to finish up on. So, in terms of what I'll go through, obviously, it's important to just have a little introduction on the demands of football, um, chat about the fatigue in football and how that really is linking into the nutrition and, and why we need to focus on the nutrition. Then, we'll go through some recommendations and kind of practice. Focusing on the carbs, <clears throat> focusing on the carbohydrates and the protein, and then we'll finish it. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat's gone already. And we we'll finish up with the strategies then for, for match day. So whenever I talk about the demands for football, um, I always, for me, it's always much or very much so an, an anaerobic sport. But then we need to sort of appreciate the, the aerobic nature of it. So I would always term it as an anaerobic sport superimposed onto this sort of aerobic backdrop. And the way I sort of visualize this really, so we got our, our timeline over the 90 minutes, we've got all these periods of maximum power activity, anaerobic activity, and these are the key moments within the match. So these are what are going to cause the difference. These are where the goals are going to be scored and things like that. But we need to appreciate we, we sort of survive in this aerobic base, which is just basically the ability to carry out all the different tasks throughout the duration and also the recovery within to sort of replenish our stores to enable us to repeat. The, the anaerobic activities as well. So that causes issues nutritionally, which we'll, we'll touch on later. And then when we follow up in terms of the specific demand, demands for football, we know there's lots of data out there. We know we have average heart rates and peak heart, heart rates of around 85 to 98 percent. Mean oxygen uptake is going to be around 7 percent V2 max. Typical distances between 11 to 13 kilometers per match. That's going to be very dependent on the position and the the tactical restraints <clears throat> of the players. And then when we look at the more high intensity actions, we know we're going to be covering over 1000 meters at, at really high speeds with approximately 60 sprints. And then regarding the utility movements, we know there's going to be around 700 turns, around 30 to 40 tackles and jumps as well throughout the match. And as I sort of just mentioned, really, so the anaerobic activities as well are, are the crucial activities for the key events resulting in, in, in goals and things. So the, the reference there is from the, the good work that uh, Fro did a few years ago. So that's the demands of a match, but we know that that's only going to happen once or twice a week. So we need to appreciate the demands of training as well. <clears throat> when we look at the demands of training, this varies significantly compared to a match. So now we're talking about players typically covering, covering between three to seven kilometers in training. So quite a large variation there and significantly lower from a match. We're only covering up to 100 to 600 meters of high intensity work and between 50 to 400 meters of sprinting. So this these ranges vary because it's very much dependent on the proximity of a match. So obviously the closer we're going to get to the match, there's going to be more of a reduction in terms of the, the intensity and the volume of training. Whereas if we talk about match day plus two, that might be a really high intense training day with a larger volume. So we know, and, and this highlights really the, the P-Res nature or the P-Res approach we utilize within training for, for football or soccer. And as I'll touch on later, this P-Res nature of training <clears throat> needs to be reflected in the P-Res nature of our carbohydrate intake as well. So there's some demands of training and competition. And if we look at how that relates to the energy expenditure then, if we first just look at match play, so we have some variations in terms of the energy expenditure here. So we have some early work by Riley and Thomas, around 1,500 calories per match, from 1,300 from Bangsball, and then in the, the nice sort of review by Stoner, which is probably a little bit dated now, um, we're talking between 1,500 and 1,700 calories for a match. Now we need to be, or we need to appreciate really that this is based on our heart rate due to regression. So it is giving us just that sort of 19 minutes. But when we sort of group it all together, we, we look in between 1300 and 18 calories per match that our players would be expending. When we compare this to training, now we slight sort of caveat here. So when we look at the training data, it's not using the heart rate VO2 re regression, it's utilizing um, WA with water, which obviously is the gold standard for energy expenditure, but it doesn't give us that sort of snapshot really. It gives us more of an overview of the day. You could work it out in terms of a minutes, but it's a lot of estimations and things like that. 
So when we look at deadly labour water used to measure during training days, we're talking around 3,500, and this is from a variety of sources from Premiership, uh, Japanese football, and football from the Dutch League as well. So we can see there that training day sometimes really is not going to be that intense. So we're not adding as, as much as many calories as we would obviously for a match. So we just need to appreciate how we might sort of plan that throughout the week. So if we just look at a couple of slides now, thinking about fatigue in football, and this is going to really rationalise why we need to have so much calories and so much carbohydrates, for instance. And one of the first sort of bits of research that sort of give us this idea that we do fatigue in football was the early work by Tom Riley. So what they identified was more scores are scored in the last 10 minutes of a match. And they sort of, I suppose, concluded that that potentially could be linked to a reduction in glycogen stores, cognitive function, which is very much related to our nutrition. So that's frequently been observed or used as the evidence for that. But obviously we appreciate now it's probably more useful to look at players' activity profiles. That might give us more informed information when we try and do that link. And there's some really good work by um, obviously Maggie Moore and, and, and Yang Bangsbo's group. So that this shows two different um, levels of football. We got more elite with the, the Sierra A teams and then some lesser players when we look at the Danish Superliga. So the Sierra A teams and the Black Bars. And this shows, this first graph shows high intensity running in 15 minute periods throughout two halves of a game. And it's really sort of highlighted in the second half with a massive reduction in our ability or the, the, the elite player's ability anyway to maintain that high intensity running. So we see that decrease throughout. And similarly, when we look at that with sprinting, we see the same trend with the high, with the elite players that in the second half is a significant reduction throughout the half in terms of reduction in, in sprint performance. So it seems to sort of suggest that we are fatiguing throughout the game. Um, linked to this sort of activity profile. And we could follow that up in maybe a more of a, a controlled sort of environment. When we look at the work by Peter Kristrup, I say controlled in terms of obviously it was in more of a realistic football scenario in terms of a, it was a friendly match, but more controlled in terms of when they looked at the sprint in here. So what they did is that they looked at sprinting at the beginning of the game, at half time, and at the end of the game. And we find similar findings in terms of you see it a reduction in sprint ability at the end of game compared to pre-match and half time. So that sort of black triangles are higher, suggesting that we are slowing down. And similar observations then within the game, we looked at a pre-match sprint after a first half intensive sprint and then second half intensive sprint. And again, what you find here, there's differences between pre-game and the second half, so there's evidence for fatigue there. But also within this one, you do find some significant differences within the first half as well. So again, this sort of coined the expression about temporal fatigue that is uh, spoken about within football as well. So it's not only that fatigue at the end of the game, but within the game itself, you have these pockets of time where players do sort of succumb to some sort of temporal fatigue. And what's nice with this research, so not only do they they show this sort of linked performance. This is now where it comes into sort of looking at um, the muscle glycogen and really sort of highlighting the link to nutrition. Is they measured the muscle glycogen within the players. So at the beginning of the match, they took muscle glycogen from the players. They measured that sort of the first half, so we see a decline there. And they repeated that in the second half and at the end of the game. It showed a clear decline in muscle glycogen. When we look, so the figure on the right now shows more of the individual fibres. When we just focus on all fibres together, it really highlights or emphasises this reduction in muscle glycogen. And when they look at them all together, it sort of shows 47% of fibres were either empty or almost empty of the muscle glycogen. And this is the link to the reduction in sprint performance that Peter Crystal and colleagues came up with in terms of why nutrition is, is key and has an, an effect on our uh, performance. So obviously this is highlighting that muscle glycogen and carbohydrates are, are really important. When we think of this for football, we need to appreciate that yes, they are very um are they key for us, but we know 
that our body has a really limited storage capacity for glycogen. If we look at an average 70 kilogram male and 60 kilogram female, we're talking around 400 for females and 500 grams for males in terms of glycogen itself. When we compare that to fat, it's clear that we've got more of an unlimited energy supply from fat, really, because we've already got more um, grams of fat stored into muscle. And then when we look at the adipose tissue, now we're not looking at grams, we're looking at, um, at kilograms, and it highlights a 7 to 10 kilogram store of energy, if you like, for males and a 9 to 20 kilogram store for female. But obviously, we can't utilize that energy for our high intensity work. So that's the limit in terms of how or why we see that reduction in high intensity activity towards the end of a match, because we are potentially depleting some of the fibers within the body that's going to inhibit our ability to maintain our high intensity work. So that's just a little bit of background sort of to, to rationalize really why we are focusing on the nutrition, why it's key for us. So what we can do now is, is, is think about what the recommendations are, but also as a key question really is, is are they being forward within our soccer players? So if I look at a little bit of research on the energy intake for elite football, so a couple of bits of information here. So we got players consume typically around just over 2,000 to 3,000 cal calories during training. That does then increase when it comes to match day. So it's now it's increasing to nearly or just under 4,000 calories. And then on non-training days, it is reducing to 2,500 calories. So we're seeing some periodization there. If we look at work by Lee Manson that conducted in Liverpool, so the black bars highlight the match and the white bars the training. So it's clear, clear that they are periodizing for a match, but there's no real clear periodization for, um, for training. Although you could argue there with two, two match days, you don't really want to see periodization, but the energy intake should be higher because when you're preparing for the match, day two is the match, day three, you're... Um, so you should still be able to high carbohydrate and then get ready for the second match. If we compare some of the matches that have produced work on energy intake and energy expenditure, what we do see, though, is a negative result in energy. So when we look at this, typically we see in around a, a two to 500 calorie deficit in the energy intake. This is quite interesting in, in the fact that if this was going on throughout the season, you would typically see or potentially see a reduction in, in weight throughout the season with these players. So we might have to take this as a pinch of salt because it might be errors within the measurement. So energy intake can be really difficult to measure accurately. You know, you've got to rely on players providing, you know, good food diaries or feedback to, to really get, a, you know, an accurate picture there. And obviously we know with energy intake, sorry, energy expenditure, that's really difficult to sort of get a, a true reflection on exactly what they're expending. So Energy intake and energy expense is probably some of the hardest uh, bits of information we can measure in sports science, in my opinion, to get a really accurate picture. We can get a good overview, but the detail, I think, can sometimes be really lacking. So this minus two to 500 calories potentially could just be within the error of some of these measurements. Or, as I said, if this was really occurring throughout the season, we would definitely see weight loss, and we, we probably don't really see that. If we switch now a little bit to carbohydrate intake, Obviously, this is the same paper that I showed the energy intake, and it shows a similar trend. So it's the carbohydrates that are, are, are providing more energy on a match day, which, which results in that increase in uh, energy intake. Obviously, again, as I mentioned, that's showing some evidence for the periodization, but a limited evidence. When we look at the carbohydrate intake, we've gone from 4.1 in training to 6.4 grams per kilogram body mass. So that's just within the recommended out. And then we could question really when they dropped that 4.1, is this enough to fully replenish our muscle glycogen stores? And I would probably argue not. What one thing I didn't mention on the Chris Strupp study, when they looked at muscle glycogen within the muscles, and we found that 47% reduction or total depletion or almost depletion, that's with level two Danish football players doing a friendly match. We know the more elite the athlete, the more high intensity work, the more sprinting is, is occurring. So potentially they're going to be depleting the muscle, the muscle glycogen stores a lot more 
than that 47 percent because they're doing more work so that would be something lacking within the literature in nutrition really is, is no real measurement of that muscle collection in, in elite players and we're probably not going to get there really any day soon but we can sort of hypothesize that we probably would expect more so therefore we probably need to replenish better and that 4.1 might not be um enough to really fully replenish our glycogen stores. Similar work was found as well with a study by Brinkmans. Um, this is a really nice study, it used a lot of a massive sample when we compare it to the Liverpool study that Anson did. So Anson's work with Liverpool players just had an N of six. This work with the, the, Dave, sorry, the Dutch football leagues had an N of 41. Similar trend in carbohydrate intake, but a little bit lower. So Periodized a little bit in terms of from rest training to a match, so a big jump on a match day, so to 5.1, but only 3.9 in training, which is just under the recommendations. And even that 5.1 in a match day would be would be low when we think about recommendations. So in terms of the recommendations, then so a periodized strategy of carbohydrates should be employed, obviously to, to, to mirror the training that the players are undertaking. So training loads should be matched with food intake, with carbohydrate, the essential nutrient, because obviously that's going to be the, the nutrient that's going to be fueling on our high intensity activities. In season, uh, with a one fixture week, um, carbohydrate range, obviously a large range between three to eight. So three when we got low training days and then eight when we're having high intensity days or replenishing from a day after a match or, or a day before. So match day minus one, match day and match day plus one need to be increased to ensure we have adequate glycogen storage and synthesis. So we're looking at a range there around six to eight grams per kilogram body mass. So you'll see in the, the Anson paper that players were getting 6.1, I think. Um, so they were just in that bracket within that range, but the Dutch players were, were below the recommended amount there. In terms of how that might look, so if we've got a match day plus two, which is like a Monday, we are having sort of a, a moderate high range, which you might still be repl replenishing. Then we've got a match day plus three, minus three minus two they might be lower days but we got to appreciate that one of those days might be a hard training day so you might need to feel accordingly there to sort of support the work that the coaches are doing and then when it comes to match day minus one match day and match day plus one we ramp up the carbohydrate intake to make sure we we uh, feel accordingly and we can compare how that might look in terms of a, a one two and three match week so we have a, a low carbohydrate intake, which is around three to five, moderate, sort of five to seven, and a high six to eight. So you can see there in terms of a one match day. So a Sunday would be a match day plus one, which is high because we're replenishing. We might drop down a little bit on a Monday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday could be low. And we ramp up on a Friday ready for Saturday. Whereas if we got a two match week, then obviously the Sunday, Monday still high. We drop down a little bit. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday's low, Friday, Saturday can remain high. Whereas if it's a three day week, we literally retain that high carbohydrate intake throughout because we're always replenishing or um, fueling up for the event. And then when we think about how our diet might change, well, I probably say it wrong, we don't need to change our diet at all as such. What we can simply do is think of how we are or the, um, the portions we provide all of the same diet, but we can just change how much of each component that we give. So for example, on a, a, a low carbohydrate day, we just have a, a thin slice of bread, whereas on a, a master minus one, a master, we have a thick slice of bread. Simple things like that. So we just have these slight variations in the portion size to make sure we match what outcome we want within the carbohydrate. If we flip slightly to protein, so when we think of protein intake, football we can see here again this is the Anson work we've got the two match day week but we see no periodization throughout the week there Carb sorry protein intake is, is very high so the average intake for the week was 2.4 grams per kilogram of body mass which in my opinion is too high there's no real need to get that it's, it's uh, unfortunate within that paper as well they don't really discuss that they don't make any reference to that sort of really high intake and as I said, that, that is the average. So there are days when it's, it's higher than that. When we compare that to other studies, so we look at an earlier study by Ron Moore, and that this was with Scottish premiership teams in the 90s. 
So the Liverpool guys had 205 grams sort of absolute intake, where it was, it was 108 grams uh, for the Scottish guys. That equated a relative amount of 1.4, which would, I'd say was just a little bit probably too low. Because when we compare it to the, the, the Brinkman study, they were getting 129 grams, which is 1.7 grams per kilogram body mass, which is within the range that we probably would, would, would want to go for. There is some work by Stuart Phillips's group that sort of say between so 1.6 to 2.2, that's sort of like the optimum range. If you go above that 2.2, potentially you're not getting any additional benefits. And if we think them Liverpool guys potentially getting too much protein, we've I've already mentioned that it might be a little bit low in the carbohydrate. It could be a case of maybe reducing the protein and sort of topping up on the carbohydrates to replenish them stores better. But they, they could be a reason some of these guys were consuming more protein maybe because they were looking to build more muscle mass or whatever. But as I said, they don't really discuss anything within, within that research paper. So in terms of what mass day preparation might look like then, so we're looking for a 6 to 8 grams per kilogram body mass of carbs in a in 24-hour period prior to a match. So we're looking for large breakfast portions, same amount for dinner, plus high carbohydrate snacks throughout the day. So obviously the primary goal really is to ensure our muscle and liver stores are elevated prior to the match. Example that gets sort of um, within that range, this is a 6.1 gram per kilogram body mass for a 75 kilogram player. So you can see there in terms of uh, breakfast, I've done nothing crazy here. It's just a standardized sort of Weetabix with toast, uh, orange juice, um, fruit cocktails, big desserts, and within the toast, you'd have sort of poached eggs. So that would be a typical, you know, nothing crazy there. Football player would be happy with that. Lunch, we just got like a sweet and sour um, chicken with rice and some and some veg, apple juice, and an apple crumble and custard for dessert. So again, normal um, lunch. And then dinner, sort of fish with mashed potatoes and, and veg, and even a nice dessert as well to keep them happy. And we've only got a couple of snacks there and drinks, so just one drink and one snack. So an easy way if you wanted to increase that 6.1 would, would be to sort of increase the snacks throughout the day in between sort of breakfast and lunch, lunch, dinner, and maybe even an evening snack, um, which would elevate that intake. So not too difficult really to get that requirement into the players. When we think of match day nutrition, we need to think about the, the timing and it's very kickoff dependent. So we know now because of TV rights and everything, um, there's lots of different times for, for a kickoff. That's going to limit our ability to provide that nutrition prior to that. And especially for a, like a midday kickoff, that makes the match day minus one even more important. So we need to make sure we are topping up and um, providing optimal carbide stores and that's sort of Friday before the Saturday morning or afternoon kickoff because we only really get a, a breakfast or that one pre-match um, opportunity to sort of eat something. Some recommendations, we're looking at one to three grams per kilogram body mass of carbohydrate. Obviously the one to three might vary. If you've got a later kickoff or a five o'clock kickoff, then you can probably go to that three grams per kilogram body, body mass for the day. If it's just that one, option, you're probably looking more than the, just the one gram per kilogram because you probably don't want to eat too much and be going into a match feeling heavy. 500 milliliters of fluid with each meal. Obviously, we, it's important to remain hydrated, but also we know that it's important to consume fluid with our food because that's going to help our body um, store our glycogen. I'd always say that the match day minus one is the most important day, really. And then the match day itself is just a top up. So as I'm saying here, breakfast is just a top up. The day before is the more important one. Pre match meal, ideally three to three and a half hours before kickoff. And obviously a high carbohydrate post match to achieve glycogen replenishment ready for the training week. It's gonna, gonna come next. This is some of my work for my, my PhD. Um, and, and this was looking at sort of the actual pre match meal itself. So obviously we got different types of carbohydrate. You've got your high and your low glycemic index foods. So obviously a high glycemic index uh, food is, is going to be something that's quickly digested and absorbed in the body as a, a bigger response to blood glucose, whereas a low GI food takes longer to digest and has a more sustained release of energy. So what I looked at is 
real meals here. So we wasn't looking at foods per se. It was a real meal in terms of it had a drink. It had um, rice, chicken, sauce. So it was a full sort of rice meal. And how we played around with the GI was looking at different types of rice. So we had a, for the high GI, we had a Ashkash rice, which is a really high GI carbohydrate. And then for low GI, we used brown basmati rice. And we also played around with the drinks. So for high GI, we had the normal Lucozade original. GI, we had apple juice. So we kept the chicken breast constant and the, the sauce constant as well. So there was the same amount of fat, same amount of protein, same amount of carbohydrate, but the GI varied. We found post meal, we find this spike in blood glucose. So obviously the high GI meal is breaking down quicker. You get that spike. Then you get that sort of, it's class called like a rebound effect in terms of following that spike, your blood glucose goes down. And again, we see a significant difference between the two there. You could argue that we're not really going that much rebound. Yes, we less than what we started with there. We're not going less than four, really. If you go going under four, that's when you might be a little bit more concerned. But we're not really going that far down. So could I? Too dangerous. And then what we did there, which I thought was quite good, we looked at blood glucose in the first 30 minutes of exercise during a simulated football match. So we measured blood glucose um, 10 minutes in, 20 and 30 minutes. And you can see their body's quite robust to the blood glucose got back to normal and sort of mirrored the, the low glycemic index blood glucose, uh, sorry, um, blood glucose. What we did as well at the end of that sort of simulated match, we wanted to try and tap into performance to see if it makes a difference. We obviously we measured um, things like RP and, and carbohydrate and fat oxidation. We didn't see any significant differences there at all. And then we, when we look at performance, we did a little crude sort of what's left in the tank where we got them to run a 1K time trail on the treadmill. And we only see a, um, a five second difference there between the low and the high GI. So high GI was faster, but not significant. It's only a slight difference. So not, no real difference between the high and the low glycemic meals. And then what we followed up that with was looking at the effects of having a high carbohydrate, low GI meal, this is a high fat meal. Similar type of meal here. So we kept the, the protein with the chicken and then all we changed was the rice again. So instead of a, a brown basmati rice, we had a, an egg fried rice. And then instead of the of apple juice, we had um, a milkshake with additional double cream just to make sure it was really fat. And what these figures show so in terms of the glycerol and the fatty acids, we see that glycerol and fatty acid are elevated significantly following the high fat meal. And when we look at carbohydrate oxidation and fat oxidation, we see following the fat meal, we have a greater oxidation of fat. And similarly with the, uh, with the high carbohydrate meal, you get a greater carbohydrate oxidation. So suggesting that when we have a high fat meal, we are utilizing more fats. What would have been nice there, which we weren't able to do, was to look at muscle glycogen and see, do we actually spare muscle glycogen here? Or is it a case of because they've had that fat sauce, they're just burning it off a little bit more and there's no real sparing of glycogen? That would be something of interest there, especially if you think of a congested football period when you might have two or three games in a week. If we can tinker around with the pre-match meals to try and spare our glycogen, then that would be really advantageous throughout the week. And then the final one in terms of the pre-match scenario is thinking about caffeine and adding caffeine with the carbohydrate meal. So this structure was, was used for all the, the research um, slides I've just gone through. So we had blood sample, a meal at 11.30, which replicated a normal three o'clock kickoff. Then we had um, caffeine at 45 minutes before the start, more blood before but also an energy drink, so carbohydrate energy drink just before the start, as you would in a, in a normal match. And then we started the exercise, which was a, a treadmill based simulation, measuring some oxidation, some more bloods, RPE, heart rate throughout. Um, again, carbohydrate drink at half time to replicate the real world, similarly in the second half. So we, we cut it short by five minutes. And we added the yo-yo intermittent recovery test level two to the end as a performance measure. And then what we saw with the addition of the carbohydrate, sorry, the addition of the caffeine to the carbohydrate meal. 
So we saw an increase in performance with the caffeine, but not, not significant levels. So we had a 12.8% difference. So it was over 100 meters increase. So it was a few couple of levels or a couple of shuttles in the test, but not significant, but maybe meaningful. So maybe some different stats we could look at there to see if actually it is meaningful. But what was quite interesting is when we looked at the RPE. And what we what I did to find is some significance here, sort of average the, the RPE over the duration of the match. But what you can see clearly here, if you look at the first half, there's, there's a little bit of difference occurring. So the the placebo, so the, the non-caffeine trial is starting to increase a little bit. But you see in the second half, that's where you start to see that that drift. So the RP is increasingly in, uh, there's, as time goes on, is increasing further. But with the caffeine, it sort of stays the same throughout. So we do find a significant difference when the data is average across the 85 minutes. So it's something to note there. And in terms of the caffeine concentration, we just give five milligrams per kilogram body weight, which if you think of um, the recognition within caffeine, recognition is within three to six to get a response. And that's pretty much what we show in there. To finish off then, we think of recovery. So during training, we need to be looking at 0.5 to one gram per kilogram body mass per hour, or you can look at it as 30 to 60 grams per hour throughout um, every hour of exercise. Because the duration of football, we could probably get away with uh, single transporters. You probably don't need to go with multiple transporters where we're having glucose and fructose because of the, the duration. And then when we think of recovery, so post exercise, we know we can get an increased rate of recovery within the first two hours. Ideally, we want to be looking at one gram to 1.2 grams per kilogram body mass. What this figure shows you, so this is really good work by John Ivey in the 80s. And what it shows is if you wait that two hours before you consume, you're not going to get that replenishment. If you eat straight away, you get this big muscle glycogen synthesis here. So we know that's going to occur because we have this exercise induced glycogen depletion, which is going to promote the activation of glycogen synthase. We know the exercise is going to increase our insulin sensitivity, and we know our exercise increases sensitivity of muscle cell membranes to that glucose delivery. So if we wait that two hours before we eat, we're only going to get potentially 50% of our potential to replenish our glycogen. And then further with, so this muscle glycogen replenishment, so when we consume a, a high carbohydrate recovery sort of diet, you can see here with the type one fibers, Within two days, you're pretty much replenishing, so there's no significant difference between rest and 40 hours. When we, oh, not great. When we look at the type two fibers, at 40 hours, we still are significantly lower within the type two fibers. And if we revert that back to our ability to sprint and the crystal paper, we show that you know, nearly 50% reduction. Even within 40 hours, we might not be fully replenished. And this is within sort of around eight grams per kilogram body weight of carbohydrate. So we need to be aware of that because we know within football there's going to be muscle damage. That's going to affect our ability to replenish our uh, collection stores as well because it's going to affect the, mem the membranes. So we just need to be aware of things like that. So to finish off in summary, if we've got like a normal three o'clock kickoff, we want to be thinking about breakfast, no pre-match meals. They need to be obviously high carbohydrate to top up the stores if we've done our day our master minds run efficiently. Then after the pre-match, we pretty much have in just want to keep to water to ensure we're hydrated, plus to support the glycogen uptake, but plus to support our, our blood glucose profile. We don't want any variation in our blood glucose there. There is potential to say um, it's not really done or it's not really researched, but if you look at some of the protein research, you might say it might be a good idea to have a protein shake to add some additional amino acids because we know we can have some muscle glycogen, so yeah, muscle protein breakdown. So you could add a little bit there. 45 minutes before a match, if you have in a, a caffeine drink or tablet powder type thing, that's when we'd have that and around six, three to six milligrams per kilogram body weight. We know there's evidence to support that. The Spanish group has done a lot to show jumping and sprinting is improved as well. Then a carbohydrate drink just before kickoff time. Then when we look at the match itself, we're thinking from the kickoff to the first half, you can probably get away with just water. Half time, we want to sort of start to include our carbohydrates. Second half, we know there's more visible 
or it's clear that we fatigue in there. So that's when we want to push more for carbohydrates within the second half. And then following the, the match, we need to start recovery. So in terms of drink, we want to replenish or we want to consume around 1.5 times our weight loss. So we replenish 150% of the, the weight loss to make sure we're hydrated. And also straight away, we want to probably at least 50 grams of carbohydrates. And then we want to get a main meal as soon as you can. And again, around one to one by two grams per gram per hour in the hours uh, after that. So that would be a summary there. And then just some brief take home points. So carbohydrate key to ensure optimal muscle collection levels are achieved. There is potential that our players not reaching the optimal levels, especially during training and recovery from matches. All PRI's approach needed within the training week then is evident. Protein intake is not an issue. We know we can achieve that with the potential that some players might be taking on too much protein. But that research is just from one club, so we've got to sort of take that with a pinch of salt. Composition of a pre-match meal may not be as important as previous if previous diet is optimal. So some of my research in terms of the high GI, low GI, high fat, because it's not showing any differences there, you could get away with if you've done a match day management properly, then that pre-match meal can be really dependent on what the player likes to get their head in the right space, so to speak. So they can eat things they're more comfortable with, and that gives them that sort of sort of feeling that they they're ready to play. And then recovery post game in the following day is important, especially during that congested fixture schedule. And yeah, that's it, guys. Thanks for for listening. I'm happy to take any questions.